Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Are winds of change blowing across Iran? The Islamic Republic's new president, Hassan Rouhani, has engineered a diplomatic opening with the United States. There's optimistic talk of compromise on the nuclear standoff and an end to Iran's international isolation. Where would that leave die-hard opponents of the regime? My guest is Reza Pahlavi, exiled eldest son of the late Shah of Iran and spokesman for the self-styled Iran National Council. Does a figure steeped in Iran's past have a role to play in its future? Reza Pahlavi in Washington, D.C. Welcome to Hard Talk. Good afternoon, Stephen, and thank you for having me on your program. It is a pleasure. Let me ask you a very simple first question. We have seen the governments of Iran and the United States open a dialogue at the very highest level. Do you welcome it? Well, of course, every time there's a possibility of dialogue to at least have a better understanding of what each side says, it is better than throwing rock at each other. The question is not having the dialogue. The question is to understand whether it will achieve anything. Well, it, of course, you're right. That goes without saying. But I just wonder whether you are now prepared to admit that you got it wrong when earlier in the year you said that whoever is elected the next president of Iran, he will simply be a puppet of Supreme Leader Khamenei. Are you prepared to say that actually was an incorrect analysis? No, I still believe that. I'm not the only one. As a matter of fact, uh, if you hear what Khamenei himself has to say, and you can clearly see that there's not a uh, uh, concert or consensus of opinion as, as to how to deal with this issue, even a simple phone call was a big issue for Khamenei, let alone the dialogue itself. That, to me, indicates that uh, as far as the, uh, the international community is concerned, you're not dealing with one uh, uh, concerted, consolidated opinion. And that would be a fragmentation within the regime that will come even more evident as we speak. But in a sense, that is my point, that what we have in new President Rouhani is a man who clearly intends to take the diplomatic initiative. His own words, quote, he has full power and complete authority to negotiate on the nuclear issue. Khamenei has expressed some concern about that phone call that we've already talked about. It does indicate that if you are prepared in the opposition to acknowledge that Rouhani is a very interesting development, that may further this dialogue. Well, let me clarify some issues so we all are in the, on the same page in terms of reading the tea leaves properly as opposed to extrapolate selectively some issues that tend to seem to be encouraging, but in reality may lead us yet again to another uh, da uh, dead end. Uh, I will start by saying that if you look at the history of this regime and its overall comportment and disposition, and to say at the very least its mission statement and reason for existence, it has been from the very beginning an ideological religious system aiming to export an ideology throughout the region and the world. Now that they're beginning to crumble under international and domestic pressure, the regime somehow finds itself between a rock and a hard place. In other words, I think bottom line, whether it's the Iranian people, the opposition, the international community, I think that the regime is faced with a lose-lose proposition. Let me explain why. If they were to cave in and go against the very essence of one unifying slogan that has kept the various fragments of this regime together so far, culminating in the infamous chant of death to America as a concept, to now negotiate with the very same enemy will send shockwaves of disruptions within the regime itself. Is that manageable by any one man in that system? Can any of the previous president have been able to do that without having the Supreme Leader uh, put pressure on it or put an end to well, it? Sure, surely or some the point, factions if I, within the Revolutionary Guards you, were against it? Yes, you lay out the skeptical case. Hang on, let me interrupt if I let, may. Well, you, let, you, let me finish my point, the, though. 
you lay out the sceptical case very clearly there, but look at the reality. Certain things, concrete things, have happened. Political prisoners, including one very high-profile female human rights lawyer, uh, have been released. Academics and intellectuals in Tehran, 500 of them, have written an open letter to Barack Obama saying, look, Rouhani is new, he is different, and we need now to see you, Mr. Obama, reciprocate the moves he's made by indicating that you are prepared to talk about the relaxation of sanctions. Do you, with your significant voice, back that call? Uh, Stephen, we'll get to the human rights issues later, and we have heard this song before under Raf Sanjani and Khatami, by the way. I was going to also say on the other high side of the coin, we may be faced with some kind of a Gorbachev phenomenon as we saw the crumbling of the Soviet empire at the very end, caving in under pressure and ultimately committing to some kind of irreversible glasnost or, or perestroika. If that was to be the case, of course we welcome it. I'll be the first person to say, any time pressure is removed from our society, it may be a more direct way to empower the Iranian people at the end. And I don't think the regime can escape that pressure. So I don't believe in isolation. I don't believe in confrontation. I have said time and again that we cannot just abandon diplomacy and go straight to war. Because in the middle of all this, one investment that nobody has done so far from the outside world looking into Iran are the Iranian people themselves who have been the most valiant defenders of values, uh, unfortunately, uh, unheard either by the regime or the international well, community. Now, for the mere fact that some political prisoners have been released, this ought not to be treated as a, a, a concession, but as a principle. All political prisoners ought to be freed. And the question, therefore, is how far is the regime willing to go to give in to many demands well beyond what the international community expects strictly on the nuclear well, agenda. How about other issues? Yeah, the point is we don't know the answer to that question. And the only way we can find out the answer is by watching and supporting an unfolding dialogue and diplomatic process. But what I'm getting to is my puzzlement with your position, because even before Rouhani came to power and you know, took this di diplomatic initiative, you were extraordinarily critical of Obama. You, in the summer of 2012, for example, described, and this is quoting the Jerusalem Post, I don't know if you spoke to them direct or they picked it up, but you described, and this is your words, a, a president in the United States who is hell-bent on ga and engaging with the Tehran regime just to prove that he's not George W. Bush. You compared him directly to Jimmy Carter in 1979. You don't sound like a man who wants to see Obama no. test what the Iranians are now prepared to give. I tell you why I'm concerned. Because first of all, the first answer given to the Green Movement back in 2009 was quite a uh, testimony as to what is the issue here. Are we trying to help the people who by the millions poured in the street, protesting the result of a rigged elections? And of course, I think their demands were well beyond that. And basically ignoring all of that to simply establish the basis that we are prepared to have a dialogue as if it was the first time dialogue was attempted. The problem is time is going by. The problem that, we, that unfortunately we are facing is the fact that Iran is on the verge of uh, uh, obtaining nuclear weapons. This is not me saying it. President Obama, as you suggested, simply said as a response to what uh, uh, Mr. Khamenei had said, that Iran is less than a year away from acquiring nuclear bomb. What does that mean, Stephen? That means that the world realizes that if diplomacy was to fail yet again, the options are becoming less and less available. And that's where I start to worry as an Iranian. Because I'm afraid that the world, because so much time has been wasted, because they fell into the traps that this regime has every single time extended to buy itself time to somehow manage to survive and basically come out with a fait accompli vis-a-vis -vis the world, that the question will be there for confrontation. And I'm trying to well, do everything to avoid confrontation. Uh, uh, Therefore, uh, if we limit the topic to simply dialogue with the regime, without preparing an opportunity that may avoid conflict and war is the part that I'm concerned with. And I don't see any of that being evident in the actions taken by foreign governments as they deal with the current regime in Iran. OK, well, you keep telling me that you look at this as an Iranian and goodness knows you have a very special, extraordinary Iranian heritage. But the fact is, right now, uh, you talk to me from Washington, D.C., and your base is in, in Maryland, in the United States. I just wonder how Iranians watching this on their televisions back in Iran are going to feel about your words. Because after all, 
you emphasize what you see as the imminent threat of Iran acquiring nuclear weapons, that to me suggests that you're more lined up with Benjamin Netanyahu, who comes to the UN and describes Rouhani as a wolf in sheep's clothing and keeps telling the world that unless something is done very quickly, Iran will be nuclear capable. Are you suggesting you still support the Israeli position that within months, if not a year or two, there will have to be a military strike against Iran? But that's exactly my point, Stephen. I'm trying to do everything to avoid a scenario whereby some governments may decide to opt for a military intervention. We will be lose-lose for all of us. But it sounds to me as, as though I you're talking many yourself many into a position where I, you actually are supporting military strikes against Iran. Because uh, nobody's focusing on what I've been saying for at least three years and then some before that, that the most important way to avoid war and when diplomacy has failed is a third way, which I refer to the Iranian people themselves on a scenario of empowerment. Now, you cannot simply expect that uh, the Iranian people, who at the end of the day are the first victims of the circumstances, under so much brutality and repression, can do all by themselves uh, things that have proven to be successful in other scenarios of nonviolent change that we have witnessed around the globe, from South Africa to many movements in the former Eastern Bloc countries, from uh, Lech Walesa Solidarity to various movements in the Czech Republic and what have you. And I don't see why it cannot happen to Iran. So we don't get into the scenarios like Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria or what have you. That's precisely why I've been saying that instead of thinking of warmongering and, and, and saber rattling and threatening I Iran and Iranians with a potential attack to their country, why not help the people themselves? Because they will be the first one to tell you, we want to liberate ourselves. But the, and the only <laughs> thing that keeps us with a world that we respect is a regime that is sandwiching us uh, and is uh, simply uh, presenting itself uh, and, prov and, and has brought our country to the brink of, of attack. But Who's the overwhelming, if that? I may say so, so the it's overwhelming the question, it's the regime itself. Yeah, but the overwhelming question when I hear you talking about a third way and referring to Lech Wałęsa and solidarity and their campaign against communism in the 1980s in Poland is what relevance does that have in Iran today and you in particular? You can't be Iran's Lech Wałęsa. You don't even live in the country anymore. There is a total disconnect between your voice in exile and the reality that people inside Iran have to live with. They tried civil disobedience in 2003, 2009, 2011. Their movements were crushed. Many of them were imprisoned. It's very easy for you to talk about another round of civil disobedience, but you're not there. Look, I, I don't know why you insist on whether or not my physical presence is the issue. What I say has meaning and has echo inside Iran. And you can verify that by virtue of the kind of communications, reactions, and responses that I've been getting, irrespective of my physical location. I consider myself being at some point in Esfahan, in Tehran, in the small cities, even in some refugee camp uh, somewhere uh, in uh, Turkey or in uh, uh, Iraq, uh, speaking on behalf of and to about the expectations that uh, my fellow compatriots have. I do it from Paris, I do it from London, I do it from all over the place. But I, I, yeah. I am not outside of Iran by choice, uh, Stephen. No, I've and been we, forced we'll, to we'll, exile <laughs> as a member of a generation that could have been there. And if I step on Tehran airport right now, what do you think is going to happen to me? Uh, the question is not that I wouldn't want to be there. But the fact that I cannot be physically in my country doesn't mean that I'm disconnected for a second. I As understand. As a matter of fact, I think that today's population and the young generation is very much in tune with what I, I, I'm saying. Well, I wonder and about, I wonder about I'm, that. I'm I mean, trying I, to address exactly their expectations. Yes, well, I, I, believe me, I want to talk about your personal situation uh, at some length in a minute. But just this final point about what I referred to as a possible disconnect between you and, and the people inside your country. Um, I'm sure you have looked at Twitter and, and the many, many reformist blogs that there are in Iran. Despite what you call the, the widespread repression, there is still a way in which Iranians who do not agree with the current regime can get their voices heard. And I've been reading a lot of the Twitter feeds and a lot of the blogs, and many people are very excited about what they hear from President Rouhani. And they have high hopes of him. And it just seems to me you are not prepared to acknowledge any of that excitement and to acknowledge that there are real hopes that we could be at a turning point moment. 
Again, I repeat, Stephen, I've heard this song before. We heard it uh, with Rafsa Johnny, uh, we heard it uh, under Khatami, and uh, since then, a good 20 years have gone by. Iran has become poorer, uh, the level of unemployment is skyrocketing. We have problems ranging from poverty to uh, uh, depression to suicide to prostitution and so many other ailments of society. And I find it hard for any Westerners to believe that Iranian gets excited as a result of some candidate pretending that he's going to come and resolve the issue. They want tangible results. Now, if you ask me where I stand, I say, of course, prove it to us, Mr. Rouhani. If you're sincere, prove it to us that the regime is willing to bend under uh, uh, expectations that are absolutely appropriate, whether it is from a domestic standpoint, an international standpoint. And but my job here is not to advocate what the international community expects from the regime simply based on its nuclear agenda. My job here is to say the Iranian people demand far more than that. They are far more concerned with human rights violations. What, what they are far you... more concerned of lack of political freedoms. They are much more concerned about lack of any instances whereby uh, they can have uh, freedom of expression. Now, if a couple of people People happen to tweet a couple of things. I don't think that's an example of absolute freedom of expression or freedom after expression. I better emphasize. And what do you propose precisely that the Obama administration or any other international government should do to help further this third way, this sort of internal rebellion that you are talking about? You've described how difficult the situation is for the people of Iran, but the one thing they seem not to want to want want to want is. Uh, sort of collaboration from outsiders. Many Iranians remember the 53 uh, meddling that the United States engaged in, which saw uh, the Mossadegh uh, regime removed from power. Do you really think that the Iranian public wants sustained intervention and meddling from outside governments to change the domestic political situation? Well, first of all, there are various narratives, and I don't necessarily subscribe to the one that you have, but that's a, an argument for another time. Look, the, the 20th century witnessed uh, all sorts of manipulations or interventions across the globe um, that basically delayed the opportunity for societies like ours to have full uh, independence and full participation in any choice they make for themselves which is exactly the platform that I subscribe to. And in fact, it is the very essence of the struggle that we have today with our demands. What do we ask the international community? Because it's your question, Stephen. Let me emphasize it. The only thing that as Iranians we ask the international community to support is our right as Iranian citizens to be able to conduct free and fair elections in our own country. In order for the people to be able to choose their true representatives, in order to be able to adopt a new constitution that would provide us with a secular parliamentary system, which would be the only way for Iran to be able to come out of this chaos and find its path back to modernity, freedom, advanced progress, and rejoining the community of free and prospering nations. Now, we're not asking the world to intervene on our behalf. All we're asking them is to defend us in these rights. And the challenge goes back to the regime. And there are only two possibilities then. Either the regime concedes under this legitimate demand, or it doesn't. And then the question is, if it does not, is the world going to pack their bags and go home and say, well, we tried, they don't want it, so forget it? Uh, are we but, going to let uh, fascist regime or totalitarian regimes uh, prevail at no cost? I mean, uh, unless Iran is an exception, then I don't see why the principle should apply to South Africa, but not to Iran. Well, or it should apply to the Ukraine and not to Iran. Yeah, you or other countries and not to Iran. You, you make a powerful case. Your passion is obvious. But are you really the right man to be spokesman for this self-styled Iran National Council. I mean, here you are, the, the son of the late Shah, a man with royal blood in his veins, but a royal family that appears to have no future inside the Iran of the 21st century. Uh, what really is the point of you being a figurehead of the opposition movement? Well, first of all, it's not about me. It's about the message. And if the message is important, it's not the messenger that counts at the end of the day. But you, but you just again, so happen to you, you, with respect, you that? are the messenger. Wait, wait a second. Hold on, hold on. How do, we, how, how, how do we measure what the Iranian people think and want if they have no ability to openly state it without any chance of being persecuted as a result of their opinions? If you want to know why there's some uh, importance of my role, among other things, is that anybody associated with being pro uh, uh, me or my family 
uh, is immediately uh, uh, subjected to death penalty in Iran. That speaks for itself. If it was uh, irrelevant, if it was unimportant, why would the regime bother uh, assassinating or executing people simply because of their uh, ideological tendencies? I'm not using this as a measure of comparison, but if you check and do your background check, you will see that when I took action against Ali Khamenei for crimes against humanity, I was voted man of the year uh, by many Iranians as it was polled uh, by, uh, for instance, Radio Fardo, which is an outlet that well, broadcasts uh, messages you, you, to you Iran. Can, you, can, you can interpret Iranian internal opinion many different ways, I dare say. But it seems to me, given what happened to your father, given all that we now know about his systemic human rights abuses, his repressive regime, the use of torture catalogued by Amnesty International, the International Committee of Jurists, the State Department, in very damning reports written about your father's regime. The Iranian people might regard you with a little more credibility if you were to say here and now that you deeply regret the actions your father took when he was in control of Iran. You apologize for them, and you want to say here and now that any future government which involves the Iran National Council would renounce so many of the things that your father did. Stephen, first of all, I've been very clear in my opinions and criticism of any of the shortcomings or violation of human rights, not just under this regime, but in the past. I've said it black and white in books, in lectures, in statements, so I am on the record. And of course I'm not going to condone at any time, at any place, any violation of human rights. Now, the actual judgment in history is left to the overall uh, public and of course uh, based on, on the facts. But I find it a little bit hard for someone like you to sit in your chair and say that while I'm held in contempt because of a genetic con uh, connection uh, that I won't be my own man uh, free to have my own opinions. It's almost like saying that I was going to judge you based on what your father or mother did. Uh, that I think is a little bit uh, uh, childish, if you uh, forgive well, my expression. If, and if I, I think I, yeah, if people I, if are well I... past uh, this kind of categorization. They have their own opinion, they know what I stand for, and it's ir irrelevant uh, to, uh, as to what uh, was done in the past because I'm talking about the future. I'm, I'm a generation, Stephen, that has enough of a backdrop of knowing what went wrong or well in the past and a bridge to the generation of the future. Do you really think you can be a bridge to Iran's future? I mean, goodness knows your family has suffered a great deal. They, many would argue you've imposed suffering, but your family has also suffered a great deal. You've lost two siblings who took their own lives because they found it very difficult to live with what happened to your family post-79. Would it not be better for you and your children who live in America to move on to accept that Iran cannot have a role for the Pahlavis in the future? But that's what you say. I, I, I beg to disagree. I think a lot of people inside Iran in final analysis think that while there were certainly some shortcomings, but there's an overwhelming positive uh, um, uh, you know, result of what was done and accomplished. Uh, in the 20th century under both my father and grandfather. Now, what I am saying to the Iranian people is not that we want to repeat the past, bad or good. We're talking about a certain series of principles that as we compare ourselves to where the world is going with free and progressive societies, as opposed to countries that are suffering under totalitarian system, religious or otherwise, of course we're not going to come out of the system. So therefore, the question at the end of the day has nothing to do with who I am and what I'm trying to do. The people of Iran will have to make that decision. All I stand for is their opportunity to decide for themselves and provide them with the least costly way to come out of this I issue. I we, think that civil disobedience and nonviolence, which has to be, which was the we, key position that I've taken and I still abide by, is a less costly way to achieve a goal as opposed to other scenarios that can, may involve conflict and violence and will not give, get us to, to, to the promised land and to democracy. That's what I stand for. We, and at we, the end of the day, let the people decide. Reza Pallavi, we have to end there, but thank you very much for joining me on Hard Talk. Thank you, Stephen. It was a pleasure.